Mr. King, I believe we need to call the roll, right? Yes, sir. Thank you. The State Treasurer, Mr. Boykin. For the Director of Finance, Mr. Reyes. Present. Mr. Lawson. Here. Ms. Hendricks. Here. Ms. Dillon. I'm here. Mr. Rosenstiel. Here. For the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Ms. Zumont. Here. And for the State Controller, Mr. McGuire. Here. Mr. Keeley, you have a quorum? Thanks, Mr. King. Uh, I think the first item on the agenda is <coughs> the approval of the work plan. I'll entertain a motion. Moved. Second. Okay, um, it's been moved and properly second to approve the work plan. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. Item uh, number two, I can just get that for a second, is the uh, Chief Investment Officer's Report, Christopher Aylman. Mr. Aylman, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, Chris. Howdy. You guys Howdy. have had a busy and uh, <laughs> exciting day so far, so. And obviously, we'll be splitting it up. I talked to John Stanton, and it looks like uh, he and I have a nice uh, transition between each other, because I'm going to creep a little bit into his space of uh, the Beltway, and he's going to talk about uh, the uh, fiscal cliff and how it affects the market. So there will be a nice tie-in between the two reports. So um, first, where we are from a, a risk factor, uh, this is PCA's latest uh, risk report that just came out this week. I wanted to note that, that equity is reaching a higher valuation, not in their charts up near a uh, extreme point at all. Um, but it actually is, is what we consider fairly valued. And then the dichotomy back and forth between real estate, we've talked about it, between private real estate values and public, a lot of that has to do with the pricing, particularly of office properties in core markets of DC, Boston and New York, uh, and some parts even of San Francisco that are reaching heights uh, we hadn't seen. But the minute you get out into the suburbs, that pricing falls apart dramatically. So here is the uh, uh, risk levels. I would highlight again that we have in the past uh, interest rate risk at uh, definitely the extreme attention range, but it may still be there. We may be talking about that all the way out into the 2015. Um, so just be ready for that. Interest rates are low. I heard somebody this week actually propose that it may be this low all the way out to 2017. Uh, who, nobody knows. We're talking about the future. But uh, we're going to have low interest rates for a while, and so that's going to be up in that segment. Uh, the break-even inflation is also reaching up in there. That has to do with the fact that in this calculation, tips are at negative yields. And so the inflation expectation between TIPS and Treasuries is really skewed by just the fact we're at such historic low interest rates. Uh, so it's not implying that we think we're going to suddenly have a surge of inflation at all. So here's the portfolio. I, I know the teachers uh, love to know the asset value. We're roughly at about $153 billion. Clearly, this week has been uh, painful. We took off some of the gains that we had earned in uh, late September and October. We're basically back to where we were in September. Uh, that's the asset mix as it uh, sits this week. Pretty static to where we were before. We're a little bit lower in our global equity allocation than we've been in the past. Uh, and you can see the tiny slices of inflation sensitive and overlay uh, because, as you know, we sold off some of our uh, uh, inflation links, linker tips, bonds. And then uh, the infrastructure we have hasn't been drawn down. But as that uh, is taken away, you'll start to see that slice of the pie increase. So uh, what's the risks on the horizon? Clearly, the fiscal cliff is number one. Uh, we're probably 55 days uh, out from seeing the start of that. And I've got a couple of slides that get into the detail on that. We were reminded after the election that, that Spain and Europe are still there. Um, obviously, China, it's not just the economic slowdown, but also the um, uh, leadership turnover, which you're going to hear a lot about, obviously, this weekend. Um, and then I wanted to highlight a couple of things on there. Um, the first was uh, stronger storms. It goes, obviously, without saying, with Hurricane Sandy and then the Nor'easter. Um, we're very clear, and I think it's been a bone of contention around certainly the U.S., about climate change, global warming. We have always described it as simply uh, that the climate is changing. We will see stronger storms, uh, more rain in some areas, more droughts in others. But it, has a, it is a definite long-term trend that we don't think anybody can deny. 
and it has investment implications. And so uh, the other one is what was written up a, a bit more heavily recently was the internet attack. I have said to you before that that is the number one risk uh, to Oxford Analytica, one of the services we subscribe to, has been their number one risk for over three years uh, and will continue. And it's not just that the internet is disrupted the concern is that the ability to pinpoint certain things, to take down um, uh, the electrical grid or to take down a bank, um, it is often said that the minute you plug in your wireless device or your PC anywhere in China, um, you're instantly part of uh, the connection back when you come back home. I talked to one general partner who said their company rule is they are not allowed to take any personal electronics into China. They borrow an equipment, they take it in there, and they bring it back and they wipe it, which is very interesting. Um, the other one I wanted to highlight was uh, RAN conflict. That's not going to be a problem, we don't believe, uh, certainly through the holiday season. But as we get closer out into the springtime, you're getting a little bit closer to that time clock that we talked about. Israel has elections and Iran has a potential change in leadership. And the view of some of the organizations is that the springtime may be a real heightened state of uh, concern in terms of the Iran conflict. And so that's another thing we'll just, as always, going up into the crow's nest and looking out on the horizon. These are the risks that exist and we live with day to day. So let's talk about the fiscal cliff. Um, this is a list of uh, the key players. As I said, I'm thrilled to have an expert in the back behind me that can fill you in on any of these people. I'm sure he knows them personally. Um, but these are the key people we're going to have to listen to, and Wall Street's going to be very focused on. Clearly, they're going to be looking for the word compromise. Uh, and obviously, you know, the big name right on the top across all those is President Obama, who was speaking today during your meeting and during your conversation about the financial statements. Uh, he had a press conference about the fiscal cliff, and we were quite glued to that and how it impacts the market. Um, but we are going to go. This is a serious uh, uh, issue. It's going to have big effects on Wall Street uh, and on the U.S. economy. So here are some of the key dates to keep in mind. Obviously, everybody's been focused in on January 3rd. Uh, you get about $600 billion of tax increases and spending cuts. But I wanted to point out that this is a can that can get kicked down the road uh, from our perspective. And John, obviously, I value his greatly, so we need to hear from him. Um, but really, you could go out to about March 1st. That's when the debt ceiling is going to become an issue again and where the, some of the spending levels actually take effect. In other words, you could go off the fiscal cliff in January, but the budget office could say, we're going to delay all these cuts until the second half of the year. You know, you get to stay on your budget for the military for the first half of the year. And if you want to get even farther down, it could actually go all the way out to a real cliff in, uh, in the summer when they would go on uh, uh, recess. So I put those little graphics in there just to kind of bring to mind that, unfortunately, the fiscal cliff may be a problem we are discussing for a considerable period of time. It is not just necessarily a January 3 event. The good news would be obviously a grand bargain and all of this goes away, uh, but this may be hanging around us uh, uh, for a period of time. So what are some of the impacts from our perspective on the investment side? These are rough estimates, and, and since, again, we're on the Internet, I would encourage that this is for the use of CalSTRS only. Uh, my advice is intended for this board and nobody, no individual and, and nobody in the public, and if they reuse this, we'd appreciate it if they'd ask our permission. Um, but so from on a low end impact, if there is a, some kind of a, a compromise and things are moved along, there still is a view that it would have a negative impact on the economy. Because remember, any kind of compromise, you're talking about some level of tax increases and some level of spending cuts. Long term, great news. Short term, most of Wall Street thinks the economy would soften, maybe even have one quarter of negative GDP as you put all these uh, things into place. The question is how much of this goes together. The high-end estimate that we've heard is if there's no deal reached, uh, the market could drop almost 20 percent. In this estimate, they assumed the can kept getting kicked down the road until you had a final collapse in the summertime, so kind of a really negative view. Uh, the best outcome, obviously, the grand bargain, a long-term impact that could raise the market about 5 to 10 percent. Uh, we went back and looked at last August, which obviously is the mo last time we dealt with the deficit 
uh, when we had to raise the def or the government had to raise the deficit ceiling and had the uh, stalemate and all of the issues. Um, just to remind everybody, we did see the equity market in the U.S. drop 18 percent in about 21 trading days that August. Um, I remember emailing the board uh, that Friday afternoon when uh, uh, they started announcing the concern about the U.S. government and the potential downgrade of credit. Um, the fixed income desk pointed out that, that all the rating agencies, the minute the election was over, started bringing up concerns and potential warnings about downgrades. We don't think that that's imminent, uh, but obviously the fiscal cliff, all of that is going to play in again. And the important nuance is that U.S. debt is still AAA with two of the rating agencies. And most legal documents allow you to hold collateral if two of the three rating agencies holds it at a certain rating. So if one of the others, Fitch or Moody's, drops their AAA, it may, not for sure, but it may trigger a lot of issues with people's collateral uh, for all kinds of transactions, it may force them to buy more treasuries, and it may force them actually to sell. So we'll have to see. Longer, shorter? Oh, they're there whenever you're... They're there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that times out probably pretty close. Um, we'll give you more of an update, obviously, uh, in closed session about what are we doing about the fiscal cliff. I'd rather, obviously, not display our trade book right away. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you unless there are questions. See any questions, questions for the CIO? Seeing none, thank you very much, Thanks. Chris. Appreciate it. California State Teachers Retirement System. Item number three on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from September 7th. I'll entertain a motion. Uh, that's a consent item. I'll entertain a motion to approve that. So moved. Is there a second to approve the minutes? Second. Okay. Moved and properly seconded. Moved by uh, Dylan, seconded by Lawson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Okay, thank you. Item number four on the agenda is the infrastructure investment policy revise. This is listed as an information item. Um, so I'm going to ask staff to come on up. And uh, Ms. Chambers from PCA. Good afternoon, Judy. Good afternoon, Dilo. Welcome. Yeah. It's nice to see the two of you. Dilo, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, today's staff is uh, recommending four revisions to the infrastructure policy. Uh, the first relates to the ex uh, removal of exclusion to the airports. Currently, the board uh, has excluded airports, schools, and prisons under the infrastructure portfolio. Staff feel that uh, airports tend to uh, generate higher returns for a portfolio and can be a diversifier. So the, uh, the revision recommendation is based on that fact. The second revision relates to uh, commingle fund term limits. Currently, the board uh, has set a maximum uh, term limit for commingled assets for 10 years. Uh, I don't think that was the intention because the objectives of the uh, program is to hold these assets long term. So what the staff is recommending here is to make it a minimum of 10 years to align it with the uh, board mandated uh, policy objectives. The third uh, change is related to the infrastructure uh, subcategory classification. And uh, what we are not, we are not recommending an overall policy limit change. The overall policy limit uh, leverage is 60% right now, and there's no change to that. What uh, staff is requiring here is the subcategory, which is the core value and opportunistic. They have maximum limitations on leverage here. And uh, based on the fact that we invest mostly on commingled assets uh, or managers, uh, it's not feasible to, it, to be a policy mandated limitation because we cannot ask a manager to change their funds leverage limit because we are not the only investor in most cases, in almost all the cases for commingled assets. So just because it's not feasible within the policy, we are not asking that it be removed either. Um, what uh, staff is recommending is that that subclassification leverage limits be mandated, uh, managed at the staff level. And I want to emphasize that is not trying to move the control from the board level into the staff level. It's purely the fact that it really doesn't uh, work for us to have it as a policy mandated limitation. 
and I can go into a detailed explanation uh, of using a, an example if needed. The final change uh, recommended is related to the daily cash limits. As you know, the infrastructure program is relatively new. We uh, just have myself as a portfolio manager and an investment officer within the program. Every capital call needs um, two uh, signatories. And just for managing risk purposes, we uh, have required that at least one signatory be from the infrastructure division. We, due to the limited resources, we have the portfolio managers of private equity and the directors of investment along with the deputy CIO and the CIO be signatories. But if, one of, if I am out of the office and a capital call comes in and the cash limit uh, is above a 10%, which has 10 million, which has happened twice so far between 10 and 20 million, uh, the, we are not able to sign off through the infrastructure program. So the requirement for that change is based on the fact that to manage some risk there, we, we, we understand the assets in the portfolio, and these capital costs are related to a certain asset that they're trying to invest in. And if there's any uh, review of the accuracy of the manager's capital call, it's easier to be done at the uh, asset level. Um, the other limitations, and be, uh, these numbers were based on, we've looked at private equity and real estate. They are within the range, private equity and real estate are at a 15 million for an investment officer one level. Uh, they do have a lot more staffing. So if one's not there, they have another person who can sign off on them. So the 20 million is nothing different. It's just within those ranges. For the deputy CIO, we've just added the deputy CIO category because that's a new position in here. And uh, the CIO level got increased for uh, pretty much the same reason as the IO1 uh, changes. Um, we, as you know, the board approved a 100, 300 million uh, first tranche allocation to IFM with an overall maximum of 500 million. Uh, there is a possibility that IFM can call that full 300 million um, uh, starting next quarter. Uh, so uh, if based on the requirement for the two signatories again, that's uh, why we have a 300 million and a 500 million for the CIO. So the question can come up, why not 400? Why not 350? Again, we looked at private equity and real estate. The director level for private equity and real estate is at a 400 million, and for the CIO level is at a 1.5 billion. So we are way under that, and it's within those ranges as well. So those are the four ch recommended changes from uh, the staff for this investment, for the policy. And uh, PCA has reviewed this policy uh, along with staff. They have put an opinion letter into the agenda. I will open it up for questions, but I'll also give Judy an opportunity to uh, speak on it. Thank you, Dilo. Before we take questions or comments, uh, Judy, I know there's a uh, letter from PCA. It's in there. Would you like to uh, comment at this point on sure. the four proposed policy changes? Sure. With regard to the inclusion of airport assets, um, we figured over time as the portfolio became more developed that that would come back. Um, in terms of the activity that we've seen in the marketplace, almost all of the airport transactions have been based in Europe and not in the United States um, to date. Um, and we think it might be some time before we see US-based airport uh, investment opportunities. Um, so we are okay with adding um, airports under the infrastructure subsector of transportation. Um, we are also pretty comfortable with the portfolio leverage level because it's not changing from 60%. As Dilo said, it's just giving um, staff more of the responsibility of uh, managing the uh, uh, leverage levels. Um, and we are also okay with the uh, 10 years minimum for commingled funds. Um, that way there will be a proper alignment, um, less tendency to invest in private equity-like infrastructure uh, uh, vehicles that are five to seven years and uh, longer, uh, longer vehicles out there. Um, and we also recognize the need for the changes to the uh, cash transfer limitations. So we'll take uh, questions or comments from the committee. Uh, Ms. Dillon. Chris, help me recall um, when we first had our conversations about the policy. I, I, we, we excluded prison schools, airports, and other large employment-based infrastructure. Um, in the write-up, we're, we're striking other large employment-based infrastructure, not just um, bringing airports 
into it or excluding, we're no longer excluding airports. Um, so we're also moving the other exclusion. What other large employment-based infrastructure projects did we have concerns about? Is there an example that you can think well, of? We've been challenged uh, by a few people who have read the policy to define that, and we can't. And that's one reason we would like to strike it is it's just kind of a, we originally put it in the policy for the board members that might recall, there was a lot of angst about infrastructure, uh, particularly from the public unions, the engineering groups. Uh, we even changed the name of it because infrastructure was considered a dirty word uh, to fixed asset financing. Um, but part of the concern of uh, board members at that time, different board members who were here, was to avoid anything that would involve potentially the loss of, of public sector or union jobs. And so we really wanted to just avoid employment bases. We wrote in that broad term just to try and be a catch-all in case there was something we didn't think of that might come into it. Um, the, as you might be aware, a lot of the public employee unions uh, and the um, uh, labor organizations have changed their point of view and now they're very uh, positive on infrastructure and very excited about it. I think uh, a labor management will always be a risk and something we want to monitor. I can't give you an, an example of what we were concerned with um, or what we might encounter as infrastructure grows as an industry. Um, we've picked managers who are particularly sensitive and have a very strong track record in that area and so we want to continue to. Um, but I can assure you we will continue to monitor it, monitor it because we don't, it was never our intent to go into infrastructure and create another area of headaches. Um, and labor issues would certainly uh, destroy the cash flow or impair the cash flow, which is what we're looking for. It's just nice, stable assets. So we would be, um, that would, the, the labor union or labor employee relations would definitely be a consideration of any investment that they would then Always. move forward on, on any of our infrastructure. All righty, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reyes. Um, on the uh, chief investment officer cap from 300 million to uh, half a billion, you indicate that well, we have private equity at one and a half billion. So it sort of begs the question, why cap it at half a billion then? Uh, our portfolio is a lot smaller compared to private equity, so we wanted to be proportionate to that as well, um, just for re uh, uh, stability in how we put the policy together. So not, not go above certain ranges, but to manage it through the ranges that we have for the rest of the classifications under that same daily limit. But if you prorate it, wouldn't it be a lot less than that? If you were to look at what we have in private equity investments versus infrastructure? It would be. Uh, uh, we ha I haven't done the calculations to uh, be able to give you the numbers yet, but uh, what we looked at was because we had that big allocation to inf uh, IFM, which is an open-ended structure, they can call the full amount in one round. And so, a billion? No, the 300 million. 300 million. Yes. So we, ha we need two people, two signatories for that 200 million capital call when it comes due. Okay. And so that's, that's how we based it. We didn't want to go too high. We, didn't, we couldn't go. We could have done 400, but we just looked at the numbers and said 500 makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Reese? Anyone else? Questions or comments on these four proposed policy changes? Uh, it's listed as an information item. If there are no other comments or concerns or questions, is there any opposition to taking this as an action at this point? Seeing none, then I'd entertain a motion that this be an action item. So moved. Second. Okay. Been moved by Mr. Reyes and seconded by Ms. Hedrick to approve the four recommended policy changes to infrastructure. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Okay, Same. thank you very much. Item number five is the asset liability study, step two, risk exposure allocation. This is going to be PCA, Mr. Uh, Neil Rue, and Chris Ailman. Mr. Emkin, are you going to join us as well? Thank you. <laughs> So just in terms of a time uh, time issue, this is listed as 15 minutes. Hmm. Is that 
Uh, no, no, no. You guys, you guys coordinated your outfits? Yeah. Yeah, look how far apart they are. Chris, <laughs> Chris, what do we have? Uh, I, have I might be red and he might be blue. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, Matt. But. Chris, what do we have uh, for the asset allocation uh, liability study in December? Don't we have that for a couple hours? We, well, we assumed you were in the, we were only going to have two hours today. Um, so uh, we had assumed this was short and that was long, but we were hoping to, to take about an hour, 90 minutes uh, in December on asset allocation. So the, the point of this exercise is to tee it up for you, take you through it, get a good dialogue, and then we have maybe an extra 20 minutes getting a good conversation about your questions. That'll help us prepare a mo uh, more information for December. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, keep that in uh, perspective. We'll be back at this in a couple of weeks, and we have a nice chunk of time to really look at it. So this is really intent is to tee this up for the December conversation. So uh, Neil, I'll turn it over. Are you going to lead us off, or is it uh, Mr. Chris? Was Neil going to lead us off here, or Neil? Okay. Go ahead. I'll just go as fast as I can. Hopefully, about 15 minutes. <clears throat> um, so we just have a little uh, PowerPoint here to show you. You know, primarily it's just an update on the work that we've been doing since the last meeting. Um, uh, answered some specific questions that came out of the last uh, topical item, and then if there's any feedback, you know, happy to hear it from you. Um, so let's just review what we talked about last time. And you'll remember, you know, sort of where we hung out was, you remember Chris, Steve, Alan, and I were up here, and one of the schematics was a slide that sort of organized, reorganized the portfolio, absolute, relative, event protection kind of, uh, organization, what if we did it like this? And that sort of moved into a conversation about exposure to macro risk factors. And then that sort of uh, came to the idea of what if we map the portfolio that way instead of under the current S allocation structure that we have now. So I'm just going to show you some pictures and just to give you a sense of, of where we're going. A couple of the, the questions that were Raise that we're trying to respond back to you all with is what does the portfolio look like under a risk allocation framework instead of under a, an asset allocation framework? Um, can STRS create these classes? Um, and <clears throat> a question that we probably won't you know get get direct directly answered today, obviously in 15 minutes, is what should our risk allocation be? And obviously, if you allocate, you know what's important to remember is just like an asset allocation, if you allocate to certain risks, that's going to dictate your long-term expected returns, just like allocating to different classes. So we'll, we'll talk about those questions a little bit. <clears throat> so let's just start. Um, some of this print might be small for you to read. I'll hopefully be able to walk you through that. But here is just a depiction of the STRS portfolio. And this is a big rectangular box. It's sized to represent um, ballpark about $150 billion of your assets. And then each little rectangular box, some of them are thick, some of them are thin, that represents your proportional allocation to that box. So you can see up on the top is US equity. On down the line, you have a really thin line there. That's high yield, not much allocated to high yield, but it's still a, a key component of your asset allocation. So what we're going to do, all these boxes are white. You'll see in a couple minutes, we're just going to paint those boxes with risk to see what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> but you can see here, just going through the bullets, if you add up 35% U.S. equity, 15% international equity, 15% private equity, that's my, if I do my math right, that's 65% exposure to equity-related risk just off the starting, starting blocks. And then you have these other classes lumped into these major categories, fixed income and real estate, that are supposed to produce a decent return but diversify against that 65% that you have. That's the basic S allocation structure that you have. And what's important is this last bullet here is you come up with this. We go through a process of looking at this strategic structure, and we put it together based on a long-term view. What are these classes, each of these classes, going to do um, over the long term, not over a particular uh, tight horizon, but just you know, over a 10-plus year horizon, and we allocate accordingly based on our beliefs. Well, the whole issue is that that um, can be uh, problematic during the long-term journey. And this is a sort of a busy chart, <clears throat> but it goes to... Sorry, no, I yeah. just apologize. 
jump in. So sure. The, the detail of this chart is uh, on page INV93 for those that don't have laser vision. So this is a pretty busy chart. You can see it's organized into sort of four tables, the two tab smaller tables on the left and the broader tables on the right. And really, it's assumptions. And in the upper left, upper, am I doing that right? upper left box there, it's those assumptions on your four major classes that really drive the allocation strategic structure that you've uh, arrived at. So you can see you have private equity producing the highest expected return with the highest amount of risk. I put, I put the expected returns in green. Fixed income has a low expected return but has very low risk. So those are the assumptions in that, in that, that, that corner of the, of the table here that drive the allocation. But what's interesting is on this right-hand side is you have what, are the, what would be the assumptions in a different kind of framework, if we looked at, at the, if we looked out there in, in sort of a regime framework, and we said, and we we sort of carved it out here in, in one form, we looked at two dimensions. We looked at economic growth, whether that's going to be fast or slow, or we look at inflation, is that going to be high or low? And we take those dimensions, create a two-dimensional four-box kind of structure there, and what would our assumptions be under each of those? They're the point of that right-hand side of the table is they're very different than the long-term assumptions. And sometimes, each of those major columns, whether it's high inflation, high growth, high inflation, low growth, low inflation, low growth, they can be just very different from what, and they can last a long time. And we've all been sort of dealing with the environment of low inflation, low growth here for the last decade, right? Decade plus. And if you look at it, actually, if you look at the assumptions and you assume that that was gonna be the scenario going forward, Look at what the public equity expected return is. It's four. Look at what fixed income is, still about the same. Private equity is outperforming public equity, but it's only by 100 basis points. It's only 5% a year. And this does reflect history a little bit. These assumptions do. So the way Sturz's real, real estate portfolio is structured, as it is, stands now, that's, you know, that kind of environment is not going to be too friendly to real estate. So the point there is that depending on the... Uh, the macro factors that are in play can really drive how your assets are going to do. And so keeping that sort of notion in mind, this sort of reflects some of the work that we've been doing um, up to this point, is we take, when working with your staff, we've come up with these five major risk categories. Growth risk, market leverage risk, inflation risk, interest rate environment risk, and market liquidity risk. And so it's not just two, it's not just economic growth and inflation, but it's six. So it's a little bit more multidimensional than just the two dimensional framework I talked about before. So then we, we're taking a model where we can say how much of these risk factors explain those classes, exp should explain those asset class behavior, and we paint each of those classes to the best of our ability to do so. And that's what's on this slide here. And a lot of colors there, but there are a couple of things that sort of pop off the page. One is you see on the right-hand side, there's these, this white box. Well, that's actually filled with nothing. That means that our model is not, cannot explain everything. So that's the first point. But if you just sort of say what on average does the, is the model explaining in terms of an asset class's returns, these macro factors are explaining about 80% of any asset class's return on average. Now, another finding is there's a lot of blue on there, and there's a lot of red on there. Well, the blue is interest rate risk. So that's sort of an interesting finding, is that there's some of these classes that maybe we didn't think had a lot of exposure to interest rate risk. There's actually a lot there. Real estate, for example, um, and, and depending on how you cut it, whether it's core real estate, value-added real estate, or opportunistic, the way the model is popping out is that um, as these asset classes are structured today, they are driven largely by the interest rate environment not so much by the inflation environment. Now that can change, but but this is what's being said. The other thing on there is there's a lot of you know there's a decent amount of red on there, so there's a lot of growth risk depending on the class. That's fairly intuitive. You can see that public equity on the top is largely driven by growth uncertainty. Um, the other you know, sticking along that theme, if you look at high yield down towards the bottom, there's a lot of growth risk in high yield, and yet you've parked we've parked it in fixed income. 
So there's a lot of equity risk, a lot of growth risk embedded in high yield should it be considered a fixed income class. So that's sort of the really the, uh, um, the interesting intuition on this kind of, of finding or this kind of uh, modeling is that it begins to reveal, you know, maybe sort of counter in some particular instances our preconceived notion about what these underlying, these particular classes are supposed to do for us. They're actually doing something different. So now with that information in mind, with that model in hand, now we're gonna go back and we're gonna paint your asset class, your asset class structure. Remember the white box in the first slide? So here we paint it. We just take the exposures to your asset classes and paint them by those colors. So what pops off the page here is that you know, there's a lot of white and that goes to, we're still working on the model better explaining total portfolio results. You'll recall, if, you, if you're thinking about your performance report, there's a lot of lag this, unlag that. We gotta get that all married up appropriately. But nonetheless, at the total portfolio level, our model is explaining well over two thirds of your portfolio's results and what's the finding here? It's basically biased towards growth in a big way. And I, that's probably maybe not necessarily a new finding, but the point is, is the growth's all over the place and all in many different classes. In addition, um, you know, the question is, is that is that the preference that you so desire? Can you can I jump in? Sure. Um, one of the things uh, the longer term board members will recall that I've said several times at offsite meetings is that our portfolio, looking back all the way to the early 1990s, um, the STRS portfolio has always done fantastic in periods of strong market growth, high GDP. We typically land in above median, if not top quartile performance relative to peers. Yet in periods of recession, which in the last 30 years, there have only been two, but they happened in the last seven years, we don't just do poorly, we do frankly terribly. Uh, we land in the bottom 90th, the bottom 10% of peers. Um, and this graph really helps show that from a figure standpoint that, that we recognize and we understand our portfolio is tilted very much toward growth. And that's part of this exercise is do we want to find other ways, maybe we're willing that, so that we don't do quite as well in positive markets uh, or positive growth periods to protect ourselves if recessions happen more frequently. On the next slide, it looks very similar to the, I'm just gonna bounce back and forth. I don't know if you can see that. These are this, the total portfolio, but there's a different allocation scheme on this second slide. And keep in mind that if you think about US equities, US equities is modeled and actually in reality it's three times more volatile than, than fixed income, three or four times, actually probably more like four or five times more volatile in terms of the journey that you're on when you hold equities versus fixed income. So we, we instead of organizing strictly by the capital that you have allocated, this chart actually allocates it by the risk that each class represents in the total portfolio. And the interesting, this is pretty interesting, you know, the red grows a little bit more as, uh, as one finding. But notice that the difference between the slides are these middle, middle tier classes between the international equity and the international <coughs> equity. And you can see that they just go away. This is an important finding in the sense that these, class, these middle tier classes, this fixed income, and I've, we've talked about this a little bit internally, they don't help in a, gro in a, in a growth crisis. And you know, yes, your fixed income portfolio holds steady, produces a 6% return in, a, in an 08, you know, a late 08 to early 09 kind of period when the equity markets are down 50%, but they don't offset. They just, they just hang out. And maybe they're up a little bit, but they're not up 50, you know, they're, they're not counter. They're not counter that risk. So from a risk perspective, they're not, given the way they're, that you're allocating to them, and in fact, something like value-added real estate actually has a lot of growth exposure anyway, so that doesn't diversify against, against uh, a growth crisis. Those middle tier classes are not helping diversify your portfolio from a macro standpoint. And that's probably, that might be a little bit of a bold statement, but that's probably a key finding <coughs> in this is, do we get the diversification against that big red area that we really want? And you know what I want to add, because I'm, I guess I'm sensitive that people watch this, I know 
Bob Maynard, the CIO at Idaho, is glued to this because he emailed me and told me he'd be watching again. He's also our biggest critic, so that helps. Um, so shout out to him. But uh, the, uh, uh, you know, for people who would say kind of, duh, we know this. Why didn't you, why weren't you aware of this? What you have to realize is that effect is almost all due to the last decade. Um, prior to this, in the 1980s and the 1990s, if we looked at this, we'd be looking back at the only other recessions, remember, were 73, 74, and then again in 81. Interest rates reacted totally differently. They would have been your anchor to windward, your hedge or your protection. And so throughout that period, we always kept that as the lower risk, less risky side of the portfolio. Will you guys jump in when you want? Um, and I think, you know, Neil drives the point home. We know correlations are not stationary. They move. And particularly in the last decade where we saw correlations start to approach one in, in 2008, your fixed income started moving in, not in lockstep, but in line with your equity markets. And in the last decade, we have seen fixed income obviously have bigger returns. We talked about the U.S. Treasuries having a 35% return and a 33% return in the last two years. Those are equity-like returns. Those are not fixed income expected types of returns. Neil, finish. finish. We're going to finish the presentation, then we're going to take questions. Neil, finish, please. Sure. So one of the questions that was on uh, uh, that got asked uh, from the board last time is, okay, let's can we begin to think of a, in a framework where we actually have classes that are dedicated, you know, in a sense, to each of these colors? So we have a class that's a growth class. It would be all red. Would, a class that would be an inflation protection class. It would be all yellow. Can, yeah, can we do that? And the answer is we can sort of. Um, and this is, this is a preliminary uh, comment because what we're doing is we're taking only CalSTRS's existing classes in a sense, moving to deck chairs, but we're not applying any kind of you know, technology and, and, or other investment ideas to the portfolio, just what you have in place now. So we have three, you know, here are those three classes. This is going back to Steve and Chris's uh, slide from before. You have the growth class, you have the pr uh, inflation protection class, and you have the event risk class. And the question is, can we do it? And you know, you know, you remember that ivory commercial, 99 and 44, uh, percent pure. We're not going to get that far, but if you can get probably to 75 to 85 percent pure, you probably it's probably pretty decent. You could use it. And based on the way uh, Chris had organized the classes, you know, he, he actually assigned certain classes to growth and inflation and event protection. We took his his uh, idea and said, okay, let's do that. And how does it play out? So on the left, you have the growth, and you can see that it's quite red. So in a sense, that's pretty good. If you organize those classes per how he, how he had them in place, the answer is yes, you can get a pretty good growth class solution. The middle, uh, we'll come back in a second. The event risk class is very interesting, but the answer there is also yes, that looks to be a pretty darn, you know, when you, when you combine treasuries, your treasury portfolio with your high quality mortgage portfolio, Ginnie Mae, Fannie Mae bonds mostly, put those two together, that's a pretty good event risk protection kind of class. So then the question is, well, if we wanted to think about inflation, uh, build an inflation protection class, the answer is, given the classes the way they're currently structured right now, you'd want that middle box to be all yellow. You have hardly any yellow in there at all. So you really need to do something, really need to be thinking hard about how to create an inflation protection class and really alter some things. So I just wanted to respond to that question. The answer in, in sort of two of the three cases is you can get pretty close. You can, you can move pretty well. The inflation uh, protection kind of class would be a bit of a, bit of a challenge based on the current modeling. Um, and I'll just sort of quickly summarize. You know, this is a model. It's a quantitative model. It changes all the time. We're looking at some snapshots here. So these colors can change. The key is, is to monitor these trends over time. And again, it is a model. There's plenty of room for, for qualitative, subjective um, overlays on top of these, the conclusions that are being shown to you from a modeling perspective, and it's important to, to take those into account. Um, but the point is, the point of the model is there's some you know, pretty interesting findings that have popped out of our work so far, and we'll come back to you with, with additional 
work um, in later meetings. So at this point, I'm happy to answer answer in any December questions. meeting, will this will you have this presentation uh, the same one, or will it be extended upon, or you won't have it? Well, I think part of the charter for the next meeting is, um, and as Chris mentioned this in his write-up for this agenda item, is there is another class that's on the table, and that's an absolute return class and what that means. And then I think, you know, part of the next step is to begin to develop, to the extent that this is a framework where we're getting direction from the investment committee that this is appropriate to move toward, we have to begin to develop um, numbers and assumptions for those broad classes as well. And just recall, you know, and that, that's not unlike what we do for the asset class, under the asset class framework, but just recall what we talked about at the last meeting, that if you have either three or four classes, and you were, in a sense, naive to which risk would play out. You know, is it going to be growth risk of the next decade? Is it going to be interest rate risk of the next decade? That if you equally allocated across those risks, you're not going to get an 8% return. It would be something lower than that. And that's, but that's, you know, where's the default position? We're trying to explore that as well. My first question, it comes back to the fact that I have very poor short-term memory. So as you were flipping back and forth between those two, two, yeah, that one and the one before. The titles look to me to be the same, so I, no, no, the, the this next one. one. This, one? <laughs> this one and the following one. Oh, yes, they are the same. So I don't understand what, what is, oh. I, I, I never figured out what the okay. difference was between those two. Sure. To those two charts. This chart, we're merely, you recall the, the first chart where there was empty white boxes. Right. That was based on allocating your capital by asset class right. definition. All we're doing here with this box is painting those capital allocation boxes by their risk exposure. I understand that. Okay. But, but the, the next one, the next one and you'll see the title is different, it, it sizes the boxes up and down by whether or not that class dominates the risk of the portfolio or not. And so that's when I said that U.S. equities actually um, contribute just by themselves probably 60% of the overall volatility of your portfolio just by itself. So its box gets painted, or its box is sized bigger. Those other classes in the middle, and you can see that it's really, you know, the, really the interesting thing is if you move back and forth between these, it's those, those subclasses labeled fixed income and real estate just get squeezed, right? Those other, the other three major groups, the growth classes, U.S. equity, international, and private equity, you know, maintain or get bigger between those two between the two scenarios. The point is, is that those middle classes, they have no volatility to them at all, so they don't contribute to the total risk of the portfolio. And, you know, the interesting thing here is, since they don't have any volatility, you know, you know fixed income has 4%, 4.5% volatility. That's how it behaves, that's how it's modeled. It's not a, not a lot of volatility. Um, in a crisis, low vol, Low volatility assets, they, they don't go, they, they stay stable. They're an anchor to windward in that context, but they don't offset. And so you still go down 25, 35, 30% peak to trough. Versus something else, and I'm just thinking in theory here, something else that might rise when growth risk goes to hell in a handbasket or interest rates, um, or you go into a deflationary environment, there are, strategies where they go, they increase in value. Is, so that's, you know, do you want to build that into your portfolio? That's one of the, one of the questions there. And, and I guess, um, you know, not because we're not going to discuss it very much to, today, but I mean, it, it does seem kind of, it does seem kind of intuitive that generally, you know, you're, we're going to get good investment returns when the economy is strong, and you know, it's going to be kind of difficult to assume that there's a, an investment strategy that doesn't rely on a, on a strong economy, um, unless we want to be mar trying to market time things. And so, you know, my my question, when you, when you come back in, in a month and we talk about this much more, is 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 uh, this makes a whole lot of sense. But I'm not sure what what it does. I, I, I don't. I'm not sure I understand how we 
remove ourselves from the exposure of a, a, a poorly performing economy unless we're trying to market time um, if generally investment returns are going to be better when the economy is better. And you don't have to answer it now. It's just it will be my question in a month. Thank you. Any any other questions? Or I think Mr. Ampkin wants to oh, respond. <laughs> <laughs> the challenge is what you're solving for. If you're solving for maximizing return, and hypothetically trying to get X, then you're going to back into the solution you just discussed. If you're saying that the enemy of a large institutional investor is volatility, and that's what theory would indicate because the more volatility it is, the bigger the penalty is for loss. And you say, what we're going to do is we're going to try to create a portfolio which is less volatile. If you solve for less volatility, then this is really relevant, because what you're going to do is say, how do you change that color mapping so that your exposures aren't to the one variable which just happens to be the most volatile variable, which is growth risk? And, and that's the difference, Paul. And, and that's really the key. The result may well be a portfolio that has a lower expected rate of return, but it will have disproportionately less risk. So part of really what Paul, you want to ring back in, please. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. So part part of what we need to be doing then is is as a board making that policy decision as to whether we're solve how much we're solving for return and how much we're solving for reduced volatility. That is the discussion. And discussing for 25 years where interest rates constantly fell and PEs constantly expanded, it was okay just to be exposed to growth. Matter of fact, the more exposed to growth you were, the better off you were. When you start off with a 10 <coughs> year Treasury yield at 1.65 and negative real expected returns, and negative real expected returns on cash, significant negative real expected returns on cash, you don't end up with the same solution. And yeah. not to ask those questions at, at today, and assuming you're going to get some historical average, you're going to use Ibbots and Sinkfeld 65 numbers worth of history, well, we're not going to get 3% real or 2.5% real out of bonds. It's just not there. So having that discussion, I don't know where you'll end up, uh, but that's a discussion we believe you and other institutional investors should have. Thank you. That helped clarify things a lot. Anyone else? Seeing on this item, obviously, is the key work of our committee for the entire year. And in December, we'll have uh, 90 minutes to two hours to continue the discuss discussion on the asset liability study. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, item number six is the information request. I don't recall any, Mr. King, whether any information requests. Any committee members have information requests at this time? Okay, seeing none, thanks. Item seven is the draft agenda for December. If we could look at that. And Chris, do you have any comments on uh, the draft agenda for December? One uh, request I have. Um, since staff doesn't sit in on your um, meetings with uh, your consultants, uh, we were unsure about how much time you wanted. We were thinking 30 minutes with each consultant, so that's on INV 110, um, item 13, 14, and 15. You meet alone with your particular investment consultants. Does a half an hour sound good? Yeah, that's about right. Yeah, that should be fine. Okay. You have uh, 90 minutes there, Chris, right? In total? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did speak to um, our general counsel and asked uh, for him to look into um, on future investment committee agendas um, the desire to have closed session items that are uh, for the investment committee only. Uh, so Brian's looking into that. There was some request for that to happen. I spoke to Mr. Ailman about that as well. So uh, it's the desire that we would have as a uh, placeholder 
closed session for investment committee uh, members only. Um, and uh, Brian will let us know how that has to be uh, agendized. Okay. Um, the other, uh, the consent calendar, there's the ESG report, the Green Initiative. Those, those items, I recall, used to be later in the year, and, and they've been moved up primarily so that we can um, keep our focus on the asset liability study after the first of the year. So anybody else have a comment or question? Chris, do you have anything else you want to add on the agenda? Not on the agenda. I had okay. a small go back on the CIO report. All right. So we'll uh, leave the agenda and we'll go back to your CIO. Chris, go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to highlight, I listened in uh, during the report on the financial statements. Uh, and Art Martinez commented about uh, an increase in liabilities, um, uh, particularly to the real estate portfolio. I know Pedro, you asked, uh, Mr. Reyes, sorry, asked a question about that. I just wanted to correct, Art didn't have uh, the full picture of the transaction. What we did is um, we had consolidated. Our separate uh, accounts have uh, bank lines of credit they use. Our separate account partners have lines they use on the real estate transactions. We felt it was smarter to aggregate those together and to bid those out as a total entity against the real estate portfolio. So uh, the liability, while it's new on that part of the balance sheet, it is simply moving from uh, note four of the financials up into a different part of the financials. That We did not increase any of the leverage in the real estate portfolio. What we've done is actually consolidated the banking relationships so we can manage them and and the size gave us obviously better scale and better pricing with the with the uh, banks directly thank you that's what i'm trying to get to item 7a is opportunities for statements from the public seeing none uh, we are going to move into closed session the remainder of our meeting is in closed session so um, Everyone have a nice weekend. We'll take a five-minute break before we go into closed session. <laughs>